All right, let's see. I have so many bookmarks and I'm going to park some of them, I think. It's good to be here tonight. I, I know that this is going to be the last time that I can, uh, at least for a while, break the bread of life with you. I love this church and I love this congregation. You, you folks are very tolerant of me especially. <laughs> Yeah, of all of us. We're all human. We all make mistakes. That's true. Yes, we do. You know, I'm, 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 I'm really, I, I think I just mentioned we're, we're planning on leaving, uh, we think, around the 12th of June, give or take a day or two somewhere in there. We're not sure if it would be the next Monday following that or maybe even the next weekend. But we're, we're going to, we, we do need to make the trip. There is some important things there that that we need to be a part of. Um, we need to see our, 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 my family too. They're my family. I mean, I want to say her family, but they're my family. Uh, they've taken me in just like I'm a natural brother. Um, I think they'd take me hunting and fishing if I wanted to go, but I'm too busy fixing up the house. I don't have time to run around and do that. So anyway, besides, I don't really, I really don't hunt and fish a lot. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of a homebody. I guess I'm probably worse than I ever was. But anyway, you know, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad. I was thinking about, and, and this isn't even part of the message, but I was, I was thinking about it. Actually, it was this afternoon. Um, I'm glad that as a preacher, I consider, I'm glad that I'm an independent Baptist preacher. Amen. I really am. I think of so many of of the, of the preachers that are that are strapped in to what they have to preach. It's dictated to them by by either convention or a diocese or a board of some kind or even a, a lexan what do they call that thing a, a lectionary I think uh, where you have a book that tells you well this is the fifteenth day past Pentecost this is what you're supposed to preach on. And so it's it's kind of handy when when you uh, when when you can't come up with something that you that you want to preach. But I'd rather preach what the Spirit of God dictates. Amen. I would I would rather do that uh, as long as it's within the confines of naturally of, of biblical theology. I mean, you, certainly you're not going to preach some strange philosophy. Uh, you're going to preach what God would have you to preach, and that's the Word of God. That's what you're going to preach. And, and I'm glad for that. I really am. I, you think that the preaching's easy. It's not. Trust me. <laughs> I, I don't have it bad. Preacher gives me a couple of weeks to work on it. Sometimes God stalls it off and doesn't let me know what I'm supposed to preach until it gets down to the last week. And they said, how about this verse? And I'll say, well, I don't know. I was thinking about this one. No, he says, I want you to do that one. So... That's the one we, we're going to do, and then uh, so I've got a I've got a a verse that's going to I'm going to preach, and and then uh, it's maybe another three four days, and he'll maybe give me an outline right away. Sometimes he stalls; he really makes me sweat sometimes. But I I, I firmly believe when I when I come to preach that I'm not preaching the philosophy of man. I'm preaching the philosophy of God. And, and I'm thankful. I, if he stalls me, that's fine, as long as he gives me the message. I don't know if I told you that. The last message I preached, God woke me up at 3 o'clock in the morning and said, Hey, bud, here's your outline. I said, God, I'm sleeping. He says, No, you got to get up and go write down the outline, or you're going to forget it. Oh, no, I'll remember. Now go write it down. So I, at 3 o'clock in the morning, I stumbled over the dog and went out in the kitchen and turned on a little light and actually sat down and wrote the outline. And I'll tell you the honest truth, I had no idea where we were going until I got to that point. So here we are again. I'm trusting that God has led me to this message. I know he has. Pastor said, you preach. I said, I already know which verse it's going to be. That's what I'm going to preach. God's told me this already. So I knew it. And I kind of gave you a, a, an idea where we were going. 
this morning, I think, I told you we're going to look at the Gospel of John, chapter 4, and we are. One other thing I'm going to reflect on before I get into the meat of the message. Now, they told me I had a whole hour, so I figured I would use it. Um, you know, the, 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 the business of soul winning, and it is, in a sense, a business. It's a calling. It's what God leads us to do as Christians. It's getting tougher. The closer we get to the end days, the tougher it becomes. And I got to thinking about that. And, and, and Jesus, when he was talking about traveling to Galilee in the Gospel of John chapter 4, he used the term, and we're going to talk about it later, but I'm going to use this as a matter of illustration. He said, I must needs go to Samaria. And you and I as Christians must needs go share the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is our responsibility, and that is our calling, no matter you're man or woman, uh, tall or short, whether you feel competent or don't feel competent. God will use you for that. It's getting a little tougher, I know. You know, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons and, and a few of the other groups have, have gotten the door-knocking routine so that nobody wants to go to the door. And it used to be the door-to-door -door salesman would keep you from going to the door. Now they're, they're soliciting you by phone now, so they're gotten around that. Maybe the Jehovah's Witnesses will start doing that. That would work all right. But the door-to-door -door evangelism is not functioning as well as it should. I still want, want us to do that. I, but I think we need to be more involved with our neighbors and our neighborhoods and our people that are around about us and our families. Those we need to reach. And that you don't do by door to door. That you do by living your life through Christ before them. You do. It's harder to reach out before others because uh, in our society today, door to door evangelism is it's kind of fallen down for us. It's not working as well as it used to. People are, are apprehensive. They're, they're, they're fearful of the, the virus, for one thing. They're fearful that you're a bad guy and you're going to break into their house by knocking on their door. And I can't blame them because that's the way society has become. And so, naturally, we have purchased, uh, you know, home security systems. Uh, we got those up there, and we got cameras posted up all over the place so you can see who's at your door. You've got one of those little doorbells. I think they call them a ring or something that's got a camera built right into that thing. And if, it, and if none of those things work, then big dogs seem to be a good cure. But... <laughs> That's what you greeted at the door with, is the 38. You've got to be careful about that. But I'm not saying that we shouldn't go door to door. I'm, I'm just saying it's getting tougher all the time. Now, those are just free. I, I don't charge. Um, but those are just kind of observations that I maybe half, I don't know, heartedly or however, made the, the, the observation, the reflection. That's what I saw. Anyway, so much for that. Let's begin by prayer. What do you say? Father, we do love you. Amen. And we are so thankful that we can be called members of the family of God. We're so glad that you loved us so much that you reached down for us and picked us up out of that miry clay and stood us upon the rock to stay. Amen. We thank you for the, what the Lord Jesus Christ has given us, and that's eternal life. Father, I ask now, take these words that you have caused me to write, Use them, anoint the thoughts and the words, make my lips your lips, 
Use me, please, Father, to bring honor and glory to your name. I want nothing except for Christ to be lifted up. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good to see you. Nice to have you here tonight. <clears throat> all right, you had the preliminaries. You know about the Gospel of John. You had all, all, ought to all have your Bibles open to Gospel of John chapter 4. If you brought your Bibles, and I know you did. I know they're here. Gospel of John chapter 4. We talked about the Gospels before. The Gospel of John is the only Gospel that's not considered to be a synoptic gospel. Now some of you may not remember or may not have been here when we talked about what synoptic means, but it just basically means the same. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are considered to be the synoptics. John is not. He's the oddball. There are stories in the Gospel of John that you will not find anywhere else. So that's where we're going tonight. We were there not too long ago. We're going to go into the Gospel of John. Um, it's, this Gospel is unique. We were there um, in February when I preached on Nicodemus and the interaction of Jesus and Nicodemus out of John chapter 3. And we talked about, of course, the very great and famous John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is the gospel pretty much in a nutshell. So this time we're going to take a look at the gospel of John chapter 4. There's a, a lot of different narratives in this thing. In, the, in this chapter. Now chapter divisions are not necessarily inspired. I guess you know that though. But there are like 54 verses in chapter 4. We're not going to go through all of them tonight. We're not going to read them, but we are going to cover them. Not all 54, only a part. We're going to choose a part. We look at this and we see that there are a lot of narratives, and I just said that. Gospel of John chapter 4 verses 1 to 30 would be one of the narratives. That's where Jesus encounters the Samaritan woman at the well of Jacob in Samaria. Now John chapter 4, 31 to 38, Jesus instructs his disciples that the fields are white unto harvest. He said these people are ready to know the gospel of Jesus Christ, especially in verse 35 where it says the fields are white unto harvest. John 4, 39 to 44 uh, talks about that fact that Jesus and the disciples lingered with the Samaritan people. They stayed there. They just didn't get a drink from the well and leave, but they stayed there. And it says in verse 41, many more believed. We have heard him ourselves. We know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. John chapter 4, verses 45 to 54 Jesus proceeds on up to Galilee where he heals a nobleman's son, sight unseen. Never sees him. Verse 50 says, Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And later we find out that the servants rushed up and told him, Your son is getting better. The nobleman inquired of the, of the servants, when did this take place? And it was found to be exactly the same hour that Jesus said, thy son is healed. He believed. At this time, with a little bit of this background, and there's some more background coming, but at this time we're going to zero in specifically on the conversation between the Samaritan woman and Jesus at the well. Jesus was motivated by some of the rumors, the words, conversation that was going around in Jerusalem. Um, the, the religious leaders were stirred up. They weren't happy with him. They weren't happy with uh, 
the uh, uh, John the Baptist. Um, they were they were wondering what was going on. They felt some rivalry. They felt some competition, and they were trying to stir up trouble. And not that Jesus couldn't handle the trouble; he could, but it was not the time. It was not the time for the, for them to have a confrontation, so to speak. So Jesus said to his disciples. Let's head on up and go to uh, Galilee. And so they were. That, and that was what their intentions was, were. They were going to go up to Galilee. Jesus opted to go there to get away from the problems that they were encountering. Now, it makes a lot of sense. If you're going to go to Galilee, and I don't know if you can picture in your head, maybe. If not, you can look in the back of your Bible probably. But you can kind of see the map. Let's see, I don't know which way it goes, but like that we'll put. And, and let's say we're down here in uh, Jerusalem, and Galilee is up here at the top, okay? And Samaria is right smack in the middle. Well, I don't know about smack in the middle, but it's, that's where it is. It's right there in the middle. So they want to get from Jerusalem to Galilee, it only makes logical sense to travel through Samaria. You know, a simple mathematical statement would be the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. So that's what, that's what Jesus said. But there was other motivations besides that, not just because it was a shortcut. If he were a good Jew, he would go out of his way to avoid Samaria. Instead of going from here through Samaria to there, he would go this way and up. They would circumvent totally Samaria. And there's a reason for that. And we're going to find out what that is. But it makes sense to go in a straight line. That's the quickest way to get where you want to go. Now, just for your information, it's still a pretty good hike. I looked, tried to figure out how far that was, and, and it's, <laughs> nobody seems to really know, but it seems to be about maybe 35 miles, somewhere in that area. Now, we're not in a car, so we're not going to get there in 45 minutes. It typically would take them anywhere from four to five walking days to make that trip. Now, you want to file that in your memory bank for just a few minutes, because we're going to find out why I want you to know that. Okay, so that's it, the, this route that they were going to take was totally un, unacceptable. I mean, any self-respecting Jew would have said, are you nuts? Are you crazy? We can't go that way. No. That's politically unacceptable. That's what they would have told him. I'm sure, I'm sure, and I, I'm speculating, but I'm sure that. If I were a disciple, I'd say, Jesus, are you sure you want to go that way? We're going to look stupid. We don't want to go that way. We can't go there. But that's the way they were going to go. They were going straight up. It was, but normally, if they were Jew, it would have been prudent to go either very far to the east, and then go north, and that's the directions they are in, to maintain dignity and respect. Now, why was that? The Samaritans were half-breeds. Half-breeds. They were part Jew, part Gentile. They intermarried. That was forbidden. And, and as such, they were considered to be outcasts by any self-respecting Jew. But they had their own religions in Samaria. And, and, and they competed with the claims of the Jews. And you'll see that in verses uh, 420 to 24. You can see that they had their own religion, and, and, and you can look at your Bibles as I'm preaching. It's fine. You can check me out, but that's what it says. And, but they, and they did believe in the coming Messiah. So they knew about the Messiah, and they knew that he was coming. And that's in verse 25. Jesus, as we said before, must needs go through Samaria. Why was that? Because God had a plan. God had a plan. He wanted Jesus to meet up with this sinful woman that was there. 
to, and to bring her through him the waters of life. In the interview that was recorded in the gospel, we see various stages that uh, Jesus, or I should say the woman went through as Jesus dealt with her by the well of Samaria. Now we'll open up on, uh, in John chapter 4, we'll look at verses 6 and 7 real quick, if you want to read or read along with me. But it says, now Jacob's well was there, Jesus therefore being wearied, now see he's wearied, now I want you to see that word, he's tired. He's a human. He just walked maybe four to five days, slept outside in the woods, ate by the bonfire, the rocks were hard, the heat was hot, he was tired. Jesus was truly tired in his humanity. Jesus, being wearied with his journey, sat on the well. Now, just for your information, that well is still there, by the way. It's nothing but maybe a hole in the ground. They tell me it maybe is 30, 35 foot in depth. still has water. Sometimes it gets close to dry, but it still has water. It's, um, although I don't, I don't think you can sit on the edge of the well anymore because it's uh, covered by an Eastern Orthodox monastery. It's inside the monastery. Pastor, did you see that while you were there? Did you? Yeah. Did you go? Yeah, okay. Good. They can still see it then. They can go inside. Yeah, good. I didn't know if they could or not. And it was about the sixth hour. Now, by Jewish reckoning, the sixth hour is about noon. About noon. And Jesus was by the well about noon, and he was tired, and he was thirsty. And he can see this lady coming from a distance away to draw water. She's not supposed to be there at that time of day. All the ladies of the the community draw water in the morning and take the water home and feed the cattle and, and all of that. She has come at the middle of the day, the hottest time, to get her water. Do you know why? She doesn't want to see the rest of those ladies in that community. They don't like her. They don't like her. Nobody likes her. But here comes the lady, the lady of Samaria, to draw water. And Jesus starts out the conversation with a spectacular statement. Give me to drink. Makes sense. I'm thirsty. Give me something to drink. Now, this woman that he's encountered at that that well, she was a member of the Samaritans, the most hated by all of the Jews. So in John 4 and 9, we see her response to Jesus' request for water. She says, the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. What are you doing asking me for a drink of water? But Jesus' love for all of of mankind far surpassed the prejudice that the Jews had for the Samaritans. And the hatred that was found within his own nation. He asked for a drink of water to start a conversation. He wanted to share the message of his salvation with this lady. John 3.16 tells us God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus was there to share the salvation that comes through him. The song says, For God so loved the world, he gave his only son to die on Calvary's tree from sin to set me free. Oh, someday he's coming back. What glory that will be. Wonderful, his love for me. Jesus loves This Samaritan woman, contrary to everything that was politically correct for a Jew. 1 John 4.10 says, Herein is love, not that we love God, 
but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So the Samaritan woman was of a race that was most hated by the Jews, but Jesus was there. This Samaritan was not only one of, a member of the race of the most hated of all that the Jewish people could think of, but I hate to say this, she had another problem. She was a woman. The Jewish people would say to you, never speak to a woman in the street even if she be thy wife. Burn the words of the law rather than teach them to a woman. These were statements, maxims that were heard throughout all of Jewish society. And in that day, and I, I'd hate to say it, but I think there's societies in this day that entertain the same attitudes. The women are considered to be a secondary citizen, and, and we know that that is not true. God has a special place and a special responsibility and a special job for the women that are his. And don't ever forget it. Never forget it, ladies. Christ unabashedly brushed aside all the social regulations which tended to encourage and perpetuate female servitudes. Yes, she was a woman. She was one of the most hated of all genders. There's only two, by the way. And she was of the most hated. So she was not only of the most hated race, she was, a, she was a, also of a most hated gender. And thirdly, she was of a most hated moral character. And I want to back up just a half an instant. We talk about women being equal in the eyes of God, they are true. Uh, Romans chapter 1 verse 16 tells us that we are not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why is that? For it is the power of God unto salvation to just a few that believe. Only the men that believe. All that believe. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. And I say to you, whether it be male or female, slave or free. God loves us all. Amen, all right. They are of most hated race. She was of the most hated race. She was of the most hated gender. And third of all, she was of a most hated moral character. This woman lived in what we would call habitual sin. John 4, 16 through 18 tells us about her. It says, Jesus said unto her, Go and call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I, I don't have a husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands. And he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, and that thou hast truly said. Thou saidest thou truly. John 4.29, she continues in her conversation after she has been confronted by Jesus and he knew everything she was. She said, come and see a man. And she's talking to the rest of the Samaritans. She says, come and see a man which told me all the things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? Christ came to save sinners. Christ came to save sinners. Christ came in Matthew 9, 13. It says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He didn't come there to find the righteous people. He wanted to find the lost people. That's who he wanted to see. Paul declares in 1 Timothy 1, 15, Christ came into the world to save sinners of which I am chief. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've done. I don't care if you think you're righteous or if you know you're sinful. You cannot be too rich. You cannot be too poor. 
You can't be too small or too great. If you truly repent of your sins, ask Jesus to forgive those sins, the Bible says in John 1, 9 that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. God is looking for you no matter where you are, no matter who you are, no matter how bad you think you are, nobody, and I mean nobody, is so bad that God cannot save you. All you need to do is to recognize that you're a sinner and repent of those sins and accept Jesus Christ and his shed blood upon the cross of Calvary and you will have everlasting life and your sins will be forgiven. Amen. If I were to give you a, a verse out of this story and I hope I, most of you know this story, right? I, I'm not skipping over stuff and that you don't know about it but I just want to hit on a few top points that that kind of spoke to me and and so that's kind of what I'm sharing with you I, I if I were to pick a text out of this uh, part I, I think uh, as far as a uh, chief text or a prime text or memory text or whichever one you want I think I'd, I think I'd pick 414 Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. Amen. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of springing up into everlasting life. Now, we've got a little time left. I would like you to take a look with me at the woman itself. This woman of Samaria that we talked about. And that's who the story is about. It's about Jesus, yes, but it's about how the woman and Jesus interacted in their conversation and how Jesus led her out to know who he was. And first of this, of, of, of three points that I, I think I'd like to share with you, the first point would be the one I would call the woman enlightened. They went in their conversation from a very natural exchange, starting with, hey, can I have a drink of water? And, and she responded a little nastily to begin with. I think she resented the fact that he, a Jew, was talking to her, a Samaritan. They felt the same about the Jews as the, Samar as the Jews felt about the Samaritans. So it went from, but we see a progression. We see it move from a natural exchange of conversation that takes place to more spiritual subjects as we get further into this. Jesus started out in a polite conversation. He opened it up very politely. He asked for a drink of water. He wasn't disdainful in his voice. Um, he knew who she was. He knew what she was. But he had no animosity in his voice. He very plainly and simply said, I just need a drink of water. Give me a drink, verse 7. Simple request. And then he completely disregarded her ungracious rebuff that she had. Not, not a word of rebuke escaped his lips. He was a perfect gentleman, even though he was a stranger to her. Christianity teaches you and I that we ought to be courteous courteous to others. We ought to be long-suffering. We ought to be patient. She was impressed by his civility. She was impressed by his demeanor. And she became successively impressed as he spoke to her. And you and I, as Christians, in our dealings with our neighbors and our friends and our families, ought to deal with civility. Don't take them by the throat and shake their heads and say, you've got to get saved. Take the time that it takes to live your life before them, 
Let them see who you are. Let them see Christ through you. Work with them. Take your time. God will give you the time if that's what you need. Sometimes you have to be a little more urgent, especially in situations where we find somebody is dying, is on their deathbeds. Then sometimes you have to be a more a little bit more forward. But then they also, true, are more open, too. They will listen, perhaps easier in that case than others. Anyway, Jesus became more and more and more as the two reacted to each other. In verse 9, if you look, she referred to him as a Jew. How is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh drink of me? For the Jews have no dealing with the Samaritans. That was the first word that she addressed him as. And as their conversation proceeds down through these verses, like in verse 10, it moves from the word Jew to the word sir. She has taken on a note of respect. Jesus and answered and said unto her in verse 10, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me a drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman said unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. For whence then hast thou that living water? And he began to talk to her. By the time we get to verse 15, she she says this. Verse 15, the woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water, that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. I still think she thinks it is a physical water, And that he's going to give her a special kind of water that she never gets thirsty again. And that's true, he's going to. But it's not the physical water that she's expecting. She still uses the address, the formal address of sir. In verse 19, we see a little change of attitude. The woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Now this takes place right after... Jesus told her that you are true, you are correct, you have no husband, you've had five, and the one you're living with isn't your husband anyway. She says, how does he know that? He said, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet, someone who knows things that nobody else knows. And definitely he would not have known that. He just met her. So that would be nothing that he would be aware of. But she said unto him, I perceive that thou art a prophet. And then in verse 29, she says to the others of Samaria that she encounters, she says, come, come and see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? So we see a progression here. We see a progression. She looked at him as as the Jew. And then she looked at him as sir, a formal means of address. And then she said, I perceive you are a prophet. And then she sees him as the Christ, the Messiah. And you need to read through this now that we kind of touch on these things. When you get home, take 10 minutes, 15 minutes tops, depending on how fast you read. And look at the words and see what it says. You'll remember enough of this to get it, put it together. I know you will. The truth and Jesus did this, must be spoken in love, and he did. Love will impress almost as much as truth will. The Lord made a special revelation unto this woman. I don't know if you're aware of this, but he never made this revelation to anybody else directly. And that was with respect to the fact that he was the Messiah. John 4, 25 and 26 says, The woman said unto him, I know that the Messiah cometh, 
which is called Christ, when he has come, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. No other place that I'm aware of did he ever reveal himself in such a direct manner that he was the Messiah. Now, how come he could do this? How come he didn't do this in Jerusalem? Why did he do it in Samaria, I wonder? Do you suppose, possibly, that the Samaritan's people, the Samaritan people's mind was more open to the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ? We know that the Jews hated it when Jesus made claims to be the Messiah or, or implied that he was the Messiah. They hated it when he wouldn't commit to the fact that he was God, but he, went, he said everything that would ever tell them that that's who he was, but they wouldn't listen. And that was their sin. They would not listen. Now, I think we spoke about that this morning. Uh, Jesus was standing up on the hillside looking over Jerusalem, and he mentioned the fact, these people will not listen. I would shelter them under my wings, but they will not listen. And these people in Jerusalem, did, they, don't, they wouldn't listen. But I think the Samaritan people's minds were a little more open. So anyway, we see a woman that's been enlightened. Jesus has spoken to her. Secondly, we see a woman that has been reclaimed. She has been reclaimed. The reason he sought to enlighten her was because he wanted to save her. Amen. Christ, by nature, sought to do that which was good. In ancient times, even in fact, even today, uh, men do good, but for the most part it's spasmodic or, or it's on a whim or uh, it's to make money, maybe. We don't know for sure, but, but, but not because that is their nature to be good. To do good was a result of natural impulses by, for man. Uh, it, uh, it's not necessarily an innate goodness. Man's not innately good. Man is innately evil. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. As a Christian, as we are here, that principle to do good should not be just an innate, it should not be just an impulse. That principle to, to do good should be just that, a principle. That should be part of our life. That should be the way we are. Plato and Aristotle, the ancient philosophers of Greece, taught that <clears throat> taught us to love men for, for, for our own sake. Christ teaches us, teaches us to love men for their sakes and for his. The essence of the gospel is not self-interest. The essence of the gospel is self-sacrifice. Christ sought to do the highest good by reclaiming the very worst of characters. Me, for one. He reached down and pulled me up out of the mud. Amen. I was a 26-year-old brat. Not living a life that I ought to be living. And he did. He reached down, pulled me out, and saved me. Amen. And I thank him. I thank him for that. Christ seeks to do the best good by reclaiming those of us that are worst. And you probably have a story too. Jesus sought to do the will of him that sent him and to finish his work. See verse 34. The Samaritan woman, as many people, found herself in a barren land of sin and shame. She was desperately in need of the well of water that Jesus offered, offered to her. 
Repeating John, John 4, 14, it says, Whoever so drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And Jesus, according to the strength of his hope and the fervor of his zeal, reached out to save this woman. So we see a woman that was enlightened. We see a woman that was reclaimed. Now we see a woman that's inspired. Inspired. The woman was inspired. She wished to import her, impart her experience with great enthusiasm. The very enthusiasm that Jesus gave her. She at once set about converting her neighbors. Amen. What's the first thing that you want to do when you get saved? I want to tell somebody else. Hey, Joe, guess what happened to me? I don't go down to the bar anymore. Jesus saved me from that. I gave up some other things, too, that Jesus saved me from, and thank God he did. Thank God he did. So she set out to tell her neighbors. She didn't lecture them, though. She didn't say, you've got to get right. You've got to be good. No, she only told them about her experience. She told them what happened to her at the well. And as her conversation with Jesus. We can all say, all can say, not necessarily can we preach, perhaps, but we all can say, despising not the, 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 the day of the small things, her saying, and I put that in quotation marks if you'll allow me to do that, led to the evangelization of the whole city that she lived in. John 4.39 says that many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying, and that's where I get the word saying, of the woman which testified, he told me all that I ever did. The success that attended the, this woman's simple efforts filled the Savior with a most holy joy. I thirsted in the barren land of sin and shame, and nothing satisfying there I found. But to the blessed cross of Christ one day I came, where springs of living water did abound. I can't sing. I'm going to read the rest of it. <clears throat> My voice is just about gone. Drinking at the springs of living water, happy now am I, my soul they satisfy. Drinking at the springs of living water, Oh, wonderful and bountiful supply. And the rest of the song goes on. How sweet the living water from the hills of God. It makes me happy and glad all the way. Now glory, grace, and blessing mark the path I've trod. I'm shouting hallelujah every day. Amen. Oh, sinner. Oh, sinner, won't you come to Calvary? A fountain there is flowing deep and wide. The Savior now invites you to the water free. Where thirsting spirits can be satisfied. We see in this passage a Samaritan woman. One who is enlightened by the words of Christ. We see a Samaritan woman that was reclaimed from sin by those same words of Christ. We see a Samaritan woman that was inspired to proclaim all that she heard of the words of Christ. Now I'm looking at my friends. I know everyone. I know your faces. I know you. For all practical intents and purposes, I know you know the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So to you tonight, maybe this is a sample, an example perhaps, of a process. This chapter is so full of materials, as is all the Bible, that you could preach ten sermons, if not more, out of this chapter alone. Easy. Easy. But I'm saying to you that this sample that we took is a sample to you to see how Christ, the greatest soul winner that there ever was, reaches out to others who do not know him. How he worked with them, how he brought them through, how he showed them who he was. And that's an example to you. And for those that may be watching or listening or whatever they're doing, and they do not know Jesus Christ, I extend the invitation. Amen. You need to drink at the springs of living water. You need to receive the waters of eternal life, of everlasting life that Jesus Christ has to offer you. And to do that, you merely have to confess your sin, acknowledge him that he is the Lord Jesus Christ, Confess your sins. The Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive us of those sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I plead with you tonight, as I close this message, please take the time to bend your knee, bow your head, and say, Jesus, I'm a sinner, and I know it. Please forgive me. Cleanse me of my unrighteousness. May I live for you. In Jesus' name. Yeah. Amen. 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 Pastor, please. Another great message, Brother Jan. Thank you, Pastor. I'm so thankful one day wasn't the same experience of the Samaritan woman. But I think you can say amen to this tonight. Every one of us here, I believe this, that know Christ. And I think, as Brother Jan said, I believe all of us here tonight are saved. But aren't you glad one day Jesus passed your way? Yeah. Amen. 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 I, I tell you, it really is been a wonderful day I would like to close <clears throat> excuse me with this if Brother Jan's already extended the invitation if by chance there's someone out there on the internet that would need help would want someone to pray with to talk with we'd like for you to contact us we'll do everything we can to help anyone we can that would reach out for help uh, just you can look up Berean Baptist Church you can find us uh, off of Collingswood uh, you can uh, I think find us in the phone book uh, but if by chance there's someone that would have a need that we could meet please please contact us we want to be a help. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're so glad each one's here tonight. Appreciate you and love you. Thank God for you. Let's stand together as we are dismissed. <clears throat> Trust and pray that you'll have a great week. Uh, go with God. I, I, I don't know. and I, You know, it's not my place to know. I... Uh, I believe I have an idea that many of our folk are handing out tracts from place to place, different, different uh, people, but at least we can do that. And like Brother Jan says, <clears throat> one reason is not, door knocking is, is getting difficult, no, no problem. That, that doesn't mean we ought not to go. But during this virus, people don't... Uh, 
I, I had one tell me this week, I went up and knocked on the door, no answer. I left a note that I was there. This person called me. Now, this is just an example I'm giving you because I know folks are concerned about this. And this person said, I never, ever open the door. She said, you, uh, for, if, if you just knock. She didn't know who I was or anything. And, uh, but said, you know, if you're going to visit me, call me first. And then I'll know that you're coming. I'm just giving you, that's, that's, the, that's what we're, the spirit we're facing out here. Uh, I understand it. I, I wasn't angry. I, I understand it uh, there. And I said, next time, I'll call. <laughs> Amen. 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 But it's been a good day, hasn't it? Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. We're glad you're here. Brother John, would you pray for us tonight? I appreciate it very much.